All right, good morning. Welcome to today's lecture, Liquid Analyzers Part B, ILM 310-304-DV. Our objectives today, finishing off talking about pH, uh, and then get into some of the other liquid analyzer uh, technologies, uh, specifically, specifically specific ion and ORP measurements. Uh, and they are all relatively similar. I'd say they're both 80 to 90 percent similar in terms of what they're well, how they're built and what they do uh, so there's a few little details in here that kind of set set apart ph specific ion and orp that's what we're going to be looking for uh, then objective four describe the principle of analysis and application of conductivity analyzers so we get into conductivity analyzers uh, in the back end of this ilm and we talk about the analyzers and specifically we talk about uh, objective five here, five here, the operation of conductivity cells, uh, which is really actually quite similar to capacitance, really, kind of. Uh, and those of you that are electricians uh, will have some background science that goes into conductivity cells. We talk about the properties of resistance and things like that. So uh, there's some uh, interesting stuff in here to look at today. So starting out objective one, we'll talk about uh, buffer solutions for pH standards. Um, and the buffer solutions for pH standards are uh, essentially the, the solutions that we use to calibrate uh, pH uh, sensors. Uh, and you can buy them uh, in, in different pH values. Uh, and usually you'll buy them to uh, kind of make bookends on, on what your measurement value is. So if you're expecting uh, that you're normally you're going to be measuring a, a pH of 7 or neutral, uh, you're going to get a couple of buffers, one on the low side and one on the high side. So maybe a number 4 buffer and a number 10 buffer. And that's how you, uh, that's how you use the solutions to calibrate uh, a pH, uh, pH probe. So that's really it in a nutshell. Uh, but we'll get into some of the details here about uh, buffer solutions and what they are and how they do that. So buffer solutions are mixtures of two or more substances dissolved in water, and their purpose is to resist changes in pH when you add small amounts of acids or bases. One of the chemicals will remove added acids or the hydronium component of it, and the other will move uh, removes the added base or the hydroxide component of it. Uh, and as such, there are two types of buffers. Uh, the first one is an acidic buffer, uh, and it is made up of a mixture of weak acids and their associated salts. And uh, that leads to some questions uh, sometimes, but don't worry, oops, don't worry about it. It's kind of out of our pay grade. Uh, just know the definition of, of what makes up uh, these buffer solutions. The second type is called a basic buffer solution obviously here the opposite of acidic uh, and it's a mixture of weak base and its salts and here's an image of what you get, what you see typically for uh, buffer solutions that will come in a bottle like this this one's a ph4 uh, blue i think is a 10 uh, and they are different colors for different ph values but those are the standards that we use so when we talk about probe standardization and calibration um, we've use a theoretical slope value of 59.16 millivolts and that number applies to every step change in the pH scale. Um, in reality, however, the probes uh, can be slightly different or they wear out and that value is not necessarily always accurate at 59.16. It also changes with temperature. Um, but we can calculate the slope uh, and that is essentially what we're doing when we're, we're calibrating. We're letting the electronics calculate the slope for us based on the upper and lower range values that we give it with the buffer solutions. So uh, the purpose of this is so that the transmitter stores the zero offset values and the slope value and then applies them to a reading. So when we do a, a buffer comparison or a calibration, um, the, ideal, the ideal situation is that it intersects or the uh, crossover point is always going to be at a pH of 7. Uh, and sometimes it'll be there will be a zero offset there, and the idea is to to get rid of that zero offset so that we get uh, linear representation throughout the range of our of our measurements. So that's the idea behind the pH buffers. So we'll talk a little bit in objective two here now about uh, sensor limitations and control problems. So um, some of the things that you might experience in the field dealing with the uh, sensors and electrodes 
themselves. We'll talk about their construction. Uh, and again, they're all uh, ultimately kind of similar uh, in terms of construction major components, but there are some minor details as we go through uh, that differentiate uh, pH specific ion and the oxygen reduction potential uh, sensors. So the first uh, sensors that we're going to look at here, this is a pH electrode here. Uh, sensors may have issues. We need to know the different parts. Most of them actually, uh, most of them will have these three components here. Uh, for sure, the first two, uh, which is a reference electrode. Uh, the second one is the measurement electrode. Uh, as you see here, we, we show them separately, a reference electrode here and a measurement electrode here. Um, and for pH, um, for pH and specific ion, um, because they are really the exact same probe with just different classes and different coatings on them, uh, pH and specific, specific ion will be temperature compensated. Uh, ORP, which we discussed a little later in this lecture, uh, you'll find is not temperature compensated and that's really the key difference between uh, the three of them. So the reference electrode, we'll talk about that a little bit here and this is more representative of what you get with a, a probe that has everything uh, in one here. So our reference electrode is isolated by this membrane right here and then we have another membrane here that isolates uh, our measuring electrode. So this electrode in a perfect world will only see the process fluid uh, and this reference electrode is happily uh, sitting in its uh, reference solution, usually a pH 7, uh, and hopefully that stays that way. Um, it doesn't always stay that way. So the reference junction, um, the idea here is to keep the electrolyte in and the process fluid out, but because this is always in contact with the process fluid, there are some things uh, that can go wrong. The first thing is that the reference junction becomes blocked with gunk. So how that happens is, is just a result of the different types of process uh, that it's exposed to. And the, the solution to that obviously is cleaning. Um, process fluid can also seep in and follow the electrolyte. So they're saying that occasionally you can get process fluid that can uh, seep in through this membrane and contaminate our reference electrode solution. Uh, once that happens, it's no longer at its standard value or reference standard of seven or whatever it is. It changes and that's going to obviously uh, cause some problems with our measurement values. The last uh, issue here, uh, membrane grows salts that are stored and dried, uh, in stored dry and becomes ruined or slow. And we get this quite often actually in the lab. We store these in a little tub uh, with some solution in it. And sometimes that all evaporates over the summer or whatever, and you can come back and actually when we go to the lab next week, uh, when we do uh, conductivity or pH, uh, you'll be able to pull a probe out of there and I'm sure you'll be able to find one that has some of these salts. Uh, that are growing on the end of uh, the electrode, but they're, we'll discuss in the lab a couple of ways that you, know, you get around that, but ideally um, you've got to keep it wet. <clears throat> okay, so through the design and maintenance, these issues can be handled. Uh, there are different designs that help keep the ends clear, uh, as well as sometimes they have automated washers uh, in order to keep them clean. Sometimes the sensors will get exposed to ions uh, that are smaller than the membrane membrane can stop. That's how they kind of seep into that reference area because the ions are smaller. Uh, to get around that issue, um, they do something called double junction, uh, which is exactly what it sounds here. It's like a double down barrier um, to try to keep the contaminates uh, contaminants from seeping through the, the two membranes in this case. So those are reference uh, electrode problems. We'll look now at measurement electrode problems uh, and you'll see that they're, they're pretty much common. Um, because we have both electrodes usually in the same probe, they usually have the same problems. Um, when we're talking about pH specifically, um, the glass electrode could have issues with the glass surface becoming coated or worn, uh, which is gonna affect performance. Again, uh, cleaners can help with coating uh, some of them blast with water or ultrasound or brushes, however they, uh, the technology is for that particular manufacturer. Specifically, uh, when we're talking about pH uh, sensor heads here, uh, remember they got that special glass coating on there. Hydrofluoric acid and sodium hydroxide uh, both erode that glass coating. 
um, and a thicker glass may be required. So just another issue that comes along with these measurement electrodes. Um, of particular interest noted in the ILM is the fact that sodium ions interfere uh, with measurements of pH and can give false readings. So that's something that you should uh, be aware of. Okay, sensor signal problems continued uh, due to that glass electrode, which is a low conductive or high resistance uh, material as glass is, why we use them for insulators often. Uh, the output from the probe cannot be measured using a normal multimeter, meaning that there's just not enough signal generated there um, through the glass electrode. So they will usually have a preamp um, to boost the signal so that it can be used by conventional meters. In the ILM, uh, there's, I believe, a couple of diagrams in there that show, uh, show where you connect a meter. Uh, if you connect a meter between the sensor and the amplifier, you won't get a signal big enough to, uh, to use. If you take a measurement on the opposite side of the preamplifier before it gets to the transmitter, then you can use uh, that signal. The problem with boosted signals, of course, is that it boosts everything, including noise. Uh, and to eliminate that, we talked about grounding and shielding um, and things of that nature that we can do to uh, mitigate the noise issues that we that we might have. That preamp uh, that I mentioned may be in the probe, uh, near the probe or in the transmitter. And the preamp by, uh, by science uh, is a much higher impedance, which means that it gets more of a signal dropped across a bit. Uh, and that allows a signal to be used by the transmitter. So some pretty specific issues that we need to be aware of. Okay, talking about some general uh, pH control problems, and we mentioned in the process class that pH is very, very nonlinear. Uh, we looked at a, a linear line. If we draw a linear line on the graph, we get a nice straight line from corner to corner. Every step that we make would have an equivalent change in the output. Um, you see the representation here of a pH reaction curve. Uh, and it's super duper nonlinear, very nonlinear. Every step in the pH scale is 10 times larger than the step before it. If you went back to our pH chart, where our pH of 1 is uh, 0.1, 2 is 0.01, 3 is 0.01, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's very significant changes, uh, and they change at different rates as, as we go through. Uh, the different stages of neutralization. And as we get close to the, uh, what's called the endpoint uh, right here, it will make a very rapid, rapid change. And you'll see that in the graph here, we're adding milliliters here at a time. So very small amounts, no change whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, another 10 milliliters and boom, it shoots up four, five, six points on the pH scale. So very, very nonlinear. And that's the biggest issue uh, control-wise uh, that we face with pH. So in order to, to um, make sure that we can deal with this appropriately because reaction times are so important, we have to make sure we have proper mixing uh, and that we have our sensor in a good location so that we uh, have everything um, accurately or a good representative mixture so that we're measuring something accurately. In a process application, uh, because of that non-linearity where uh, little itty bits make a big difference, um, starting out here, we can add we can add quite a lot without any change. We can add quite a lot without any change, quite a lot. And then as we get here, we have to really start dripping it in, in essence, in order to try to have some control on this uh, severe slope that we have here. So we have to be able to uh, neutralize um, in in some kind of steps. We can go fairly aggressive in the beginning because nothing is going to happen. And we slow down when we get to approaching that endpoint. And then we really got to trickle it in uh, as, as we get to here to try to avoid this really steep line if we wanted to, you know, get it to go up mildly. So one of the applications um, in, in industry that's used to do this is uh, something like we see here in this diagram where we have um, an injection station uh, that uses different sized valves. And you see a big, 
big valve here uh, for a pH at, at one, uh, a middle sized valve here when the pH is near three, and then a much smaller valve uh, when we're approaching the pH uh, of seven. So this effectively will introduce lots in the beginning, reducing it as we get closer, and then finally just add, allowing the trickle uh, of our reagents in the, in the final stages as we approach our set point. So that's one of the process ways that we get around that nonlinearity that's associated with uh, pH. So that closes up uh, the pH section, and then we get moving into objective three here, which describes the similarities and differences uh, between the uh, pH specific <clears throat> And ORP measurements, and we have discussed some of some of these already. Uh, you're going to see that pH and specific ion are very very similar, uh, and ORP is only slightly only slightly different. Okay, so we use all of these devices, of course, for water measurements. That's the premise of uh, third year analyzers: is water measurements uh, and water quality, as we learned in the introduction. Uh, presentation uses almost all of the liquid analyzers that we talk about in this third year curriculum, uh, including pH, ORP, and specific ion analyzers. Uh, and we're going to look at how they are similar and different here. Okay, so specific ion slash pH. So you'll see that I've kind of grouped these two together, and there's a reason for that because pH really, by definition, is a specific ion measurement. It's specifically measuring the concentration of the hydronium ion. We call it pH because it is a major, it is a major measurement, um, but it is a type of specific ion uh, sensor. Not to be confused in this course with other types of specific ion. Uh, when I'm asking about specific ion sensors or types of specific ion sensors, I'm talking about anything except for pH. We'll call pH pH and we leave it as that. Um, so other um, specific ions that can be measured include calcium, copper, uh, chloride, fluoride, etc. Principle of operation is exactly the same. Temperature and uh, compensation is also included. Uh, most common one that you'll probably see in the water, uh, clean water treatment is fluoride. Most municipalities add fluoride uh, to their drinking water. Um, so that is one specific ion that is relatively common uh, for measurement in, in water treatment. So the major differences between the sensors themselves, um, aside from the fact that they have a measurement electrode or reference electrode uh, and temperature compensation, uh, the, what sets them apart basically is the fill fluid or the electrolyte that's in them and the membranes that set them apart. And sometimes it's the material of the probes. So that's the dirty, dirty lowdown on specific ion and pH. Next, we look at ORP theory, and we just barely touched this in chemistry uh, so far. We, uh, we've mentioned the terms oxidation, I believe, before, um, and reduction. We haven't really got into it, so this might be a little bit of a gray area uh, at this point in time, but uh, we will hit on this again in chemistry to give you a little bit more background on the science. But the long uh, story short here uh, is an oxygen reduction potential sensor measures the, uh, the activity of a reaction or, or the ions that are being exchanged back and forth between different compounds as a reaction happens. So it's a measure of activity, uh, not necessarily any specific thing. So well, let's just get some definitions out of the way here. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gaining of electrons. An oxidant is, has, is, a, is a compound or a element that has the ability to oxidize, thereby being reduced itself. And I understand that this, some of this is confusing. It will make more sense uh, once we uh, review it again in chemistry. Uh, a reductant has the ability to be reduced, thereby being oxidized. This is more confusing probably than it's and then than it's worth. Uh, the last one here is a noble metal. Mentioning this because usually the uh, electrodes are made out of noble metals, uh, and noble metals are inert or non-reactive non-reactive non metals. Uh, some of them gold, platinum, titanium. Uh, other metals also fall into that category. Um, but the big thing here with ORP, 
Uh, it has to do with oxidation and reduction, and it has to do with some compounds losing electrons, another compound gaining electrons, and then measuring the amount of electrons that are moving back and forth between these oxidizing and reducing uh, compounds in a reaction. So the oxidation reduction potential is the net millivoltage produced by the number of oxidizing and reducing agents that are mixed together. It's really a measure of activity. The amount of voltage generated is determined by the quantity or excess of either oxidation or reduction components in our process. And the result of those is the movement of these electrons from one uh, to the other. Case, looking at the probes here, similar to the pH measurement, two probes are used, meaning a reference probe and a measurement probe. Uh, the reference probe gives a constant reference voltage that is not canceled out, but needs to be compensated for. Uh, an ORP measuring probe, which is made with a platinum electrode, gives the voltage that is caused, again, by either the excess of either an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent, and the activity of the electrons uh, that are being released in that uh, reaction. ORP sensors are not temperature compensated and the simple reason and it's always been this very simple reason is because they are too complex. There's no other description given in the ILM about how complex they are um, but they are complex and that's all you need to really worry about. Okay, so what's the difference between ORP and or pH or specific ion? The main difference is that there is no temperature compensation for ORP. And ORP measures the net voltage produced by redox reactions, uh, redox is reduction and oxidation reactions. And pH measurements uh, measure ion concentration uh, via current flow. So the uh, concentration of Ions goes up, pH goes up, concentration goes down, pH goes down. So that's the comparison of the technologies. Objective four coming up next here describes the principle of analysis and application of something new, conductivity analyzers. So this section, um, they've done a good job of making it confusing. Um, Hopefully, I'll make it. I'll do a good job of making it less confusing. So, conductivity analyzers quite simply measure a liquid's ability to pass electrical current or conduct current. If we relate this to wire science, uh, current is the electron flow in a liquid. Current is the charged ion flow. So we have these ions. You, you see here, positive ions are attracted to the negative electrode. Negative ions are attracted to the positive electrode. The greater number of ions, the greater current flow we're going to have. These ions come from an acid base or a salt that has been disassociated. Um, and um, disassociation means that it frees up these uh, ions, basically. Remember um, from chemistry, I think we've discussed this already when we talked about uh, electrolytes, um, a strong electrolyte will completely disassociate into ions and a weak one does not. So strong electrolytes are things like uh, salt, for example. Uh, salt water is a strong electrolyte. If we take salt, uh, sodium and chlorine and we dissolve it in water, it will completely, uh, it'll completely break apart into sodium ions and chloride ions and the concentration of them will increase. Uh, the amount of ions in our solution and cause great current flow between the electrodes. If I took something like uh, sugar, uh, for example, uh, and we haven't looked at a chemical compound for sugar, but it's got carbon and hydrogen and some oxygen uh, and other things in it. When it disassociates, it doesn't completely disassociate into ions. Some of the things stay together, thereby there is not as many ions available uh, to, to go back and forth and we get a lot less current flow. So this disassociation is also called ionization. So this diagram here shows that the ions are attracted to the opposite uh, electrodes and movement of these ions from one side or from the solution to the other and creating this kind of bridge, so to speak, um, 
causes the current to flow, and the more ions there are, the more current can, can, can flow. Okay, one of the main factors that affects conductance is that total ion concentration. I hope I'm stressing that enough. Uh, higher concentration, higher current, lower concentration, lower current, um, like a bucket brigade. Um, more people means more water flow, less people means less water flow. It's pretty, pretty simple science. Conductivity measures the conductivity or lack of resistance to current flow. And here's where we get into some of the uh, hairy math explanations. We'll start out with Ohm's law because um, ultimately it is kind of as simple as Ohm's law despite uh, some of the terms that we throw at you here to kind of make things a little bit more confusing. Uh, when we're talking about Ohm's law and wire science, uh, we know that the characteristics of a wire uh, will, will dictate the current flow through a wire. Things like cross-sectional area, length, and the material all contribute to the resistance of a wire or the resistance to flow. Uh, when the electron flow is resisted, we call it resistance. When the electrons flow, uh, there is also conductance, which is the opposite of resistance. So there's a balance here, right? If I have resistance, the opposite to resistance is conductance. So simply that relationship is a reciprocal. Um, conductance is the reciprocal of resistance, therefore conductivity is the recipro reciprocal of resistivity. And simply put, uh, the reciprocal is just one over the other. So conductivity is one over resistivity. Conductance is one over resistance. That's how we figure it out. The ILM does a good job uh, confusing us, um, but this is one of the formulas that we end up using. Uh, going into the next few pages here. So resistance is found by looking at all of these different variables here. So uh, static resistivity, uh, resistivity, which is based on the uh, wire type, for example, and this is looking at it in terms of wire science still. Uh, so the type of material that we um, are building our wire out of, uh, R, of course, is the total resistance of the material. L is the length of the piece of material, and A is the cross-sectional area of the specimen. So resistance is a function of the material, the length of the material, and the cross-sectional area, so the overall amount of the material. This is leading us up to um, using the process fluid um, as our wire. So flipping that formula around, uh, the the uh, conductivity formula, we can find the resistivity of a piece of wire. And resistivity is basically just taking uh, a measure of resistance per unit, basically, is what we're doing here. So resistivity in this context is the amount of resistance based on the length and cross-sectional area of the conductor, uh, whether it's copper in this diagram here, or whether it's process fluid, which is what we're, we're building up to. So basically we're saying if we have a measured resistance of, of some value here, we know our cross-sectional area and we know our length, we can then provide a, a number, a resistivity number based on, you know, per centimeter or per meter or whatever it happens to be. It is based on the overall size of the conductor. Um, we can do the same thing with conductivity and that relates to the cell size of the conductivity uh, sensor, which is where we're building up to here. So in order to calculate conductivity, it's best for us to first look at resistivity because we kind of understand resistance a little bit better. So we've done this talking about the wires. When we're measuring the resistivity of a liquid, the size of the uh, the size of it is the size of the cell, okay? So it's that area between the, the plates or the two electrodes. Uh, it is the equivalent of the cross-sectional area and length of a wire. And this is very, very similar to the, the, the area uh, or the distance between plates and a capacitor as well. So let's see what all this uh, hollow blue and fancy verbiage is all about here. So an example here, now you notice we've switched over uh, to liquids here. Uh, the resist resistivity is equal to 
the resistance times the measure of area that the conductor takes up here. So giving, given a value here uh, of 760 ohms, we're measuring uh, across um, the cell here. And then we're taking our cell area, which is one centimeter, and our cell distance here, which is 10 centimeters. So that's our, uh, this is our L over our A, which is essentially building our cell. It's telling us that our total resistance divided by our cell size gives us a resistance of 756 ohms per centimeter. So it sounds a lot worse than it is looking at it here, right? All we did was took the total resistance and divided it by the size. It's not so bad. So in this example, the conductivity is going to be the inverse of this. If this is the resistivity, the inverse of resistivity is conductivity. So to do that, one over conductivity. We do this number, uh, we get 0 0.00132 and we get conductivity. Conductivity is measured in a unit called Siemens, uh, or in this case, it's Siemens per centimeter, which is a fairly uh, large unit in terms of measuring conductivity. So we most often, at least in this class, uh, used, uh, I think this should be, I'm not sure if this should be micro or milli, but at any rate, uh, we generally use a smaller unit. And in this case, it's going to be 1.23 uh, milli Siemens per centimeter. And I should probably just double check to make sure that that, uh, that unit is right. I think it's milli. I don't want to get that wrong. Pretty sure it's milli Siemens anyway. No, maybe it's micro Siemens. Micro Siemens, milli Siemens. It uses both, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we did some math here representing this thing here. And we got a new word that goes along with that. It is called a cell constant. So the cell constant refers to the ratio of the length to the plate area. So there it is. This is our cell. We're measuring our length or the difference between the plates and the plate area here. The unit for a cell constant is the reciprocal centimeter. I don't want you to try to understand what exactly that is, but remember that the unit for the cell constant is, oops, the reciprocal centimeter or cm to the negative one. So if the cell constant is one, that means that the conductivity is equal to the conductance, which is not going to happen for us. If not, there's some math. We've already seen it, L over A, which gives us our cell constant. And let's just look at what some examples are. So here's a cell constant, our length or distance between the plates is one centimeter. These are all based on the same uh, size of plates, but distance uh, between them changes and you'll see that our cell constant changes uh, along with them. What we're leading up to from here uh, is that certain uh, solutions uh, will have much more conductivity than other solutions which means that we may or may need a, a more sensitive cell or a less sensitive cell uh, and this is how we measure the sensitivity of a cell using these cell constants. Uh, so we'll end up using these numbers in order to be able to select uh, a proper cell constant for the process that we're measuring. Okay, so we're gonna get from conductivity to conductance. Uh, the relationship uh, is not a reciprocal here because these are essentially the same units. So there's a little bit of math in here, but again, uh, it's not terrible, terrible math. We can find the conductivity if we know the conductance and the cell dimensions. So this is, I guess, the second calculation. I guess really, yeah, I guess it's the second calculation that we looked at. So conductivity uh, is the uh, symbol L, conductance is the symbol G, and we drop it into this formula to find conductivity. We take the conductance and we multiply it by our cell constant, okay? Um, G is measured in Siemens or micro Siemens. The cell constant is measured in that reciprocal centimeter. Uh, and L is also uh, measured in micro Siemens. Let's look at an example. OK, 
Okay, calculate the conductivity of river water that has a resistivity of 978 and 987 ohms per centimeter at 25 degrees. So conductivity is the opposite of resistivity. So in order to find that out, we just put it one on top of the other. One over seven or 987 is 0.001 Siemens per centimeter or you go 10 to the three and you get 1.01 milli Siemens. If you went 10 to the six, you would get uh, 1,001 whatever milli Siemens. So we pick the unit that makes the most sense to, to write it here. So that's not very tricky math. Uh, this is the toughest math that you're going to have to do here. Uh, an analyzer measures a conductance of 444 micro Siemens using a cell constant of 1.043. What is the conductivity reading? Using our formula L equals G times cell constant, we punch in our numbers 444 micro Siemens times our cell constant tells us that we're going to get 463.09 micro Siemens per centimeter. That's, that's it. That's, I believe, the end of the math. Okay, getting back to reality here, uh, measuring conductivity, uh, and we're gonna look at two types of conductivity cells. The first type is a contacting cell, uh, which has the electrode in direct contact with the liquid, and the second one is a electrodeless type conductivity cell, um, which in, induces current flow through the liquid using non-contacting coils although it does somewhat contradict itself in the ILM. Uh, but the idea generally behind it is, uh, this is good for most processes. Uh, these come into play when you get processes that are problematic for these ones, things like uh, sticky stuff, coating, and things of that nature that'll change uh, the physical characteristics of the, of the sensor's ability. So looking at contacting cells here, very similar. Uh, in terms of a capacitance uh, type probe here, two electrodes are placed in the sample. An alternating voltage is applied to the electrodes at a uh, frequency 15,000 hertz, I believe is the number in the ILM. And those ions will move back and forth with the electrodes and uh, the amount of AC current that makes it through the uh, process medium and conductor in this case is proportional uh, to uh, the concentration of ions, of course, that are in the process fluid. DC voltages are not used for excitation, and this is for the same reason we saw in other applications, particularly magnetors, uh, where we saw uh, the effect of polarization uh, and bubbles that form on the plates, which in turn will cause higher resistance and false readings. Uh, long story short, bubbles on the electrodes will make the conductance values lower because bubbles are not conductive. Electrodeless sensors, uh, something like this here. Uh, different versions of it. The old ILM used to show uh, these coils on the outside of the pipe. This is why I say uh, it's kind of it's kind of misleading. Uh, when you look at this as, as non-contacting, because to me it looks like it's contacting. Um, but trust me, there, there's supposed to be a differentiation there. Okay, so these, in theory, have no electrodes in contact with the process. Two toroidal, as your word of the day, two toroidal coils, one drive coil and one sensing coil, uh, are used. The drive coil will induce a current into the liquid uh, and through the liquid to the sensing coil. Uh, and then the transmitter will measure that current in the sensing coil as it will be proportional to the conductance of the liquid. The liquid that flows uh, through the coils thus is not in direct contact. It is what it is. Benefits here, no polarization uh, and fouling and coating are eliminated. That's the big, that's the big selling point for these non-contacting ones. Applications, um, contacting style use metal electrodes that make them become coated or corroded, and they are used in liquids that will not really do that, such as non-corrosive liquids, liquids that are free of solids and oils, which would cause coating, uh, lower conductivity value fluids, uh, which, uh, because this is a little bit more sensitive, they are ideal 
for high purity water, like those used in steam plants, where we want to make sure we have uh, no, uh, you don't want any minerals in your water because they cause coating inside your piping. Uh, and minerals like calcium and magnesium and things like that uh, are are ions and uh, they're easy to measure for a conductivity probe. That's, uh, that's one of their main applications. Boiler feed water uh, is, a, is a good one. Okay, non contacting uh, probes are best suited for corrosive liquids, high, high solids or sticky liquids, uh, highly conductive liquids. Uh, they are not good for low conductivities. A uh, common application uh, is measuring white and black liquor in the digesters in the pulp and paper industry. Okay, uh, other applications for conductivity generally, uh, water treatment for mineral removal, um, and again, scaling is, is a big one there. Desalination, so the app measuring for the absence of conductive salts to prove that your desalination is working. Uh, leak detection is another common application. So the measure, measure uh, presence of cooling water uh, in demineralized heating water or exchanger tube leaks, you'll often see conductivity uh, conductivity meters on exchangers um, because um, if the tube were to leak, for example, it would change the conductivity of the, sh the shell fluid. Uh, and that's one way that they can detect that. They are also used for concentration measurements in pulp and paper uh, to indicate the strength of digesting uh, solutions. So let's look at concentration measurements a little bit. Uh, KCL or potassium chloride is used to calibrate these probes. It has a linear relationship with conductivity. We'll do this in the lab. Uh, some substances such as sodium hydroxide um, are problematic. Uh, they have increasing conductivity with concentration until such a point where it becomes saturated. I'm only mentioning this because this is specifically mentioned in the uh, ILM. So uh, no, there are problems with things specifically sodium hydroxide. Uh, once it becomes overly concentrated, the measurement will begin to drop off. Um, just an interesting thing about sodium hydroxide, I guess. Um, <clears throat> They're also used in digesters, again, to monitor the condition of the liquor that digests the wood pulp. Okay, objective five, um, operation of conductivity cells. So we're gonna look at temperature compensation, uh, selecting the proper cell constant, and then calibration and troubleshooting as we normally do. So temperature compensation, why do we need to compensate? What do we need to know about it? Well, we need to know this for sure. Temperature has a great effect on conductivity. And how great, you ask? For every degree in temperature increase, conductivity goes also up by about 2%. So temperature goes up, conductivity goes up, temperature goes down, conductivity goes down. Standard temperature for conductivity measurements is 25 degrees Celsius. Cell constant selection. So what we are actually measuring is the liquid's conductance. So if that liquid has a low conductivity, it will also have a low conductance value. So we have to choose a cell that will be sensitive enough, sensitive enough but not overly sensitive. Low conductivity requires a small cell constant, high conductivity, a high constant. Remember this, okay? So picking the right cell is important. If a conductivity or a cell constant of one is used on low conductive liquids, it won't be accurate enough. If it is used on high conductive liquids, the values will be too high for accurate readings. I've included some tables at the end of this uh, presentation that'll kind of show you what cells and some common fluids uh, to help with cell selection. Calibration, uh, pretty straightforward. We'll be doing this in the lab. Uh, calibrated in a KCL standard. Uh, the standard is usually 1,354 uh, microsiemens, but they can change a little bit. Um, ensure that you have no bubbles on your probe. We know, we learned that it, it affects our conductivity. Uh, and the transmitter usually takes care of the rest. Excuse me. 
Uh, if you need to input the cell constant, you can find it doing some math uh, that we did earlier here. We Our cell constant, uh, we take our conductivity standard and we divide it by our instrument conductance. And uh, there's an example, I think, coming up on how to do this. Okay, determine the cell constant if the transmitter calculates for a cell from this data. The calibration standard is 1354, which was normally the standard. Uh, and the transmitter conductance value, bad spelling there, is 131.2 microsiemens. I believe this is a value that would be given in the specifications uh, for the device. So again, plunking these numbers, 1354 and 131.2 into this formula, uh, we can get our cell constant uh, of 10.32. So this is a uh, high cell constant, which means it's going to be in high conductivity uh, fluids. Troubleshooting. First step, determine if the fault is in the sensor or the transmitter. Uh, you, can simulate, um, you can simulate an input to the transmitter uh, if you need to. Uh, generally, the transmitter will usually self-diagnose and display its own fault. Um, check for proper immersion of the sensor. Of course, none of these sensors are going to work unless they're in the process fluid. Check for damage to the sensor, coatings on the glass, scratches, uh, chips, coating, that kind of stuff. Uh, check for electrical defects by measuring the continuity and resistance of the probe and the wiring. Uh, a resistor can be used on an electrode input to simulate the conductivity. So you just simply disconnect your sensor, put a resistor across the terminals, and sense uh, the reaction. Uh, you could do the math here to determine what the transmitter uh, should be outputting uh, based on some of the theory that we looked at before. Um, but we're going to show you here how to do this. Okay, the cell constant for this transmitter is 0.103. Uh, determine the conductivity when using a 500 ohm resistor for simulating at the electrode inputs or the sensor inputs. Conductivity, again, L is equal to G times the cell constant. Uh, our conductance is the inverse of resistance. So our resistance here is 500. Therefore, our conductance is 1 over 500 or 2,000 micro Siemens. Our conductivity then is that number 2000 times our cell constant of 0 0.103, which is point, or sorry, 206 uh, micro siemens. This is what the transmitter should be displaying. So interesting that you can, uh, you can simulate that. Okay, this is getting us close to the end here. Let's hope and pray that this link works and I can get you to, uh, to look at it. Yes, I know we're not there yet. Uh, okay. There, there. Oh, what am I trying to find here? Where did that video go? You would think that this would get easier over time. Working on it. Many liquids are essential in our daily life. They may include water. Can we see the video? Yes? No? Yes. Yes. Beverages, dairy products, chemicals, acids and bases, or pharmaceutical products. The quality of these liquids is determined by their chemical and physical properties. To assess these properties, various principles of measurement are used. One of these principles is the measurement of electrical conductivity. Let's start with a closer look on why liquids are conductive. The electrical conductivity of a liquid arises from the dissociation of soluble salts, acids, and bases to form positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. 
these ions contribute to the charged transport in the electrical field and thus to the current flow, just like electrons in a metal. In 1869, German physician Friedrich Kohlrausch developed the first conductometer for electrical conductivity by using an alternating current to measure electrolytic resistivity for the first time. The physical unit of electrical conductivity is Siemens per meter. To determine the value, the so-called conductive and inductive measuring principles can be used. In case of the conductive measuring principle, two electrodes are positioned opposite from each other. An AC voltage is applied to the electrodes, which generates a current in the medium. The cations move to the negatively charged electrode, while the anions move to the positively charged electrode. The more free charge carriers the liquid contains, the higher the electrical conductivity and the current flow. A 10% acid, for example, is a very good conductor because it contains many ions that transport the charge. In contrast to this, pure and ultra-pure water are bad conductors because they contain only few ions. If, however, the ion concentration becomes too high, the Coulomb force increases. This electrostatic force leads to a mutual repulsion of the ions and thus a reduction of the current. The effect is called polarization and occurs with highly concentrated media. The electric resistance, or its reciprocal value, the conductance, is calculated from the measured current according to Ohm's law. To derive the specific conductivity from the conductance, the so-called cell constant must be determined. It is based on the geometry of the electrode arrangement and reflects the distance of the electrodes in relation to their surface. It varies depending on the electrode design and influences their suitability for different areas of application. Conductivity is also dependent on the medium temperature. Therefore, the temperature is measured in parallel and the conductivity values are referred to a reference temperature of 25 degrees Celsius by the transmitter. Conductive sensors have a simple design and are highly sensitive, which makes them suitable for a wide range of applications from ultra-pure water to drinking water and more. The inductive measuring principle uses the inductive conductivity sensor. It contains an electromagnetic transmission and reception coil in a protective plastic coating. An alternating magnetic field is generated in the transmission coil, which induces an electric voltage in the liquid. This causes the positively and negatively charged ions of the liquid to move and generate an alternating current. This current again induces an alternating magnetic field, and thus a current to flow in the reception coil. The intensity of the current depends on the number of free ions in the medium. It is evaluated by the transmitter, and the conductivity is calculated. The advantage of inductive conductivity measurement is the galvanic isolation from the medium. Polarization effects cannot occur, and the measuring principle is insensitive to soiling. The conductive and inductive conductivity measurement by Andrus and Hauser enables precise control of water treatment and cleaning and rinsing processes, for example in the food, life sciences, and chemical industries. For further information on liquid analysis, okay, so uh, that's the end. So just at the end here, uh, I have some leftover stuff that was in the previous ILM that I left at the back here. Just some tables here to show you um, cell constant and different processes. So small cell constant, low conductivity solutions, large cell constants, high conductivity solutions. 
long story short right there. Okay, so you may see questions like, uh, you know, what kind of, what, what conductivity cell would you use for seawater? Uh, what conductivity cell would you use for ultra pure water? Uh, what would you use for drinking water? Something like that. You should have a kind of a general idea uh, of where you would apply a certain cell constant. That is the end of this lecture. Thanks for joining me today.